Yeah, uh, my name is John, and uh, with my colleague, I have uh, Gayatri, and we are from Center for Budget and Policy Studies. And uh, today we will be presenting uh, the topic analysis of taluk level ICDS data to understand for beneficiary enrollment patterns during the COVID-19 period. And basically here uh, we will be analyzing the uh, uh, supplementary nutrition uh, program beneficiaries among the women and children uh, at taluk level. And also we will be analyzing uh, uh, as wise uh, uh, underweight children at taluk level and the rationale behind this study is that uh, we know that we have uh, many uh, uh, state level national level as well as we have also uh, 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 district level studies on this issue and we have also some study ground level studies on this issue but what we found find from these studies that the conclusion and the results we uh, uh, derive from these studies uh, do not even do not match and that's why like we try to look into uh, uh, the taluk level data and for example if i can give example we see the reports of uh, national uh, family health survey uh, that shows that uh, in case of uh, karnataka particularly uh, the percentage of wasted and uh, 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 stunted children has declined during the covid-19 period but the ground level survey suggests that the malnutrition problem in, Kar in Karnataka during the uh, COVID-19 period has increased. Uh, so by looking at these uh, uh, disparities in the findings, here we try to establish uh, that the nutrition specific schemes, basically these schemes are insensitive to the local context and therefore we try to uh, we try to deviate from the monochromatic rights perspective that is uh, homogenization of the issue or problem. Now before going into the anal analysis, let me first discuss the background of this paper. Uh, now we know that uh, in March two th uh, 2020, uh, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 uh, the global pandemic and we know that after that, uh, the almost all of, all of all the countries across the uh, world they imposed various COVID-19 related restrictions like lockdown and India was also one uh, among them. Uh, and the main objective of uh, uh, the COVID related restriction was to contain the coronavirus. So, however, uh, what we saw is that these restrictions also brought, uh, also resulted in humanitarian, humanitarian crisis across the country. For example, if we say, if you take the health sector, we find that uh, apart from the health emergency, we also look at the food supply crisis. That was because of uh, the uh, disruption in the uh, food supply chain. We also saw how uh, the lockdown uh, uh, put strain on the public institutions, such as, uh, for example, the Anganwadi Center, schools, panchayat, and banks, which are the uh, 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 primary medium for the delivery of the public services. And uh, because of this shutdown of this, uh, uh, public institutions, we saw that the vulnerable com communities particularly, they were deprived of scheme benefits. Many studies uh, suggest that these, human these human humanitarian crisis during the COVID-19 period is attributed to uh, the underdeveloped uh, health infrastructure and also pre-existing economics uh, and uh, uh, health disparities. For example, if we see the uh, case of India, like if we see the uh, economic history of India, we find that uh, in rec recent decades, India achieved, a impress achieved an impress impressive economic growth, but this economic growth has not been translated into the uh, improvement in the social sector, particularly in the health sector. And that's why what we find is that the progress in health indicators uh, is very slow. And here we, it, this table reflects uh, the uh, condition of the uh, 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 a slow uh, improvement in the health indicators and here what we find is that su uh, the sustainable development goals uh, target uh, a new natal mortality rate of 12 and under 5 mortality rate of 25 by 2013, 2030 uh, but our current status, uh, India's current status of NMR and under 5 mortality rate uh, uh, are 25 and uh, 42 and what we perceive from this uh, data is that we are still far away from achieving the target set by the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Now, in case of other uh, health indicators also, we find that uh, India has performed very poorly. Uh, if you see the anemia among the children and also, next slide, anemia among uh, mother, we see that over the time, uh, the condition has worsened. 
Now the similar trend we find for the Karnataka also. Now Karnataka has performed very well in terms of economic progress and uh, that is Karnataka has been one of the top five states in India with a per capita uh, GSDP of uh, uh, 3.05 lakhs that is which is highest among the top five states uh, in India. But uh, what Niti Ayok Health Index uh, 2021 so, uh, saw that Karnataka doesn't even uh, fall uh, in the group of top five performance performance in the health sector, and in the, in this table we see that between NHS four and NHS five, the percentage of uh, stunted children, wasted children, and underweight children has declined slightly. But in case of anemic uh, anemic children and anemic women, the percentage has uh, um, uh, increased. Now, Karnataka has a very well-known uh, nutrition-specific schemes. Uh, for example, we have Madhuru Purna Yojana, under which uh, uh, hot cook meals are served to the uh, pregnant and lactating in women. And also, we have uh, Srishti egg schemes, under which eggs are provided to the children for in, in order to improve their uh, nutrition. And we have also Kirabhagya schemes, under which milk is provided to the uh, uh, school-going children in order to improve their uh, uh, nutrition. Uh, and we have also many other uh, such uh, uh, well-known uh, nutrition-specific schemes. Uh, now, the, during the COVID-19 period, all these schemes uh, became dysfunctional. And uh, there is a study uh, uh, by a civil, civil society organization called People's Union for Civil, Li uh, civil Liberties, uh, which had done survey of 80 villages across the Karnataka state. And uh, the report shows that uh, after lockdown, many schemes such as midday meal schemes, PDS, and nut uh, many nutritional supplement schemes uh, uh, were discontinued for many months. And the study also report that uh, uh, out of the 80 villages, in 70% uh, of the cases in villages, uh, the study report that uh, the children did, uh, had not uh, received uh, eggs for many months. And uh, they also report that 75% of the pregnant and lactating women who received uh, ration as a part of take home ration, but uh, the quantity was very less. Now, based on this uh, background, uh, here we assess the access to safety net programs by vulnerable groups such as children, pregnant, and lactating women at the taluk level during lockdown. And we also assess the nutrition status of the children throughout the period of COVID-19 lockdown. Now we have done a literature survey on this issue, like we have divided our literature uh, survey uh, literatures into uh, three sections. The first section is COVID-19 and food and nutritional insecurity and what we, what many uh, uh, literature suggests that uh, food insecure households generally uh, rely on four broad strategies to maintain access to food, that is they change their expenditure pattern, that is they uh, shift from a luxurious Exp uh, expenditure on luxurious good to uh, uh, expenditure more on uh, food items and they also rely on uh, their uh, family family relatives or social network uh, and they also rely uh, uh, on the government uh, nutritional support program and also uh, charitable food system now the uh, studies suggest that all these uh, strategies became less feasible during the lockdown period for example if you uh, take the case of change in the expenditure pattern uh, uh, then uh, we we what we see is that during the lockdown uh, the there was a sudden spike in food uh, price of food items and uh, although the parent the family uh, they uh, shift their they uh, uh, they increase their uh, uh, expenditure on food items by reducing the uh, expenditure on luxurious item uh, but their real, real income uh, decreased so that makes this strategy uh, that ma made it made the strategy less feasible during the lockdown period. Now, in the another section that is COVID-19 and its nutritional effect on women and children, what we find is that COVID-19 disproportionately affected the dietary patterns of women particularly, and uh, this has this happened because of the existing uh, uh, socioeconomic factors in our society. For example, uh, in our uh, in many communities in India, uh, we find that women eat after the after all the family members have eaten so what happens is what happens is that when uh, such uh, uh, societal uh, uh, um, sub such relation uh, exists in the society when uh, uh, the food shortage occurs in the households the women become the most uh, 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 most affected by most affected in terms of food consumption
now uh, in term we also look at the government measures during the lockdown and uh, um, what we what many suge many studies suggest is that uh, during lockdown government government could not continue with the existing policy so government uh, fi found out alternative strategies for example karnataka uh, uh, introduced tech home ration but uh, this strategy uh, also was also challenged but was also also faced many challenges like mismanagement and that is due to the increment in the number of beneficiaries and uh, um, and that resulted in the low quality uh, delivery of low quality ration among the uh, people so to meet our uh, objectives uh, we mostly depend on the monthly uh, progress report on snp beneficiary of 10 taluks from 10 districts of karnataka and uh, this monthly progress repro report was obtained uh, by the center for budget and policy studies through rta application and here we have taken here these are the 10 uh, 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 taluks we we are studying and this monthly progress report uh, basically consists of the information on beneficiary enrollment for the supplementary nutrition program and also it includes the uh, information and number of underweight children uh, now this uh, monthly progress report uh, this data is provided uh, for the period of april 2019 to march 2020 and we have uh, divided this period into three groups that is first is april 2019 to march 2020 as pre covid period and april 2020 to september 2021 as covid period october 2021 uh, to march 2020 as post covid period and here we use descriptive, descriptive statistic uh, to draw inferences from the data now I invite Gayatri to continue that uh, presentation. We have collected actually data for three years and the way we have analyzed the data is to divide it into six month periods. So there are, there are six six month periods of which the first two periods are the pre-COVID. Then the second six month period that starts from April 2020 to uh, September 2020 was the first wave and the lockdown. Then the second, the next period was six months was between the two waves. And the third period within the COVID was the second period, second wave and the lockdown, second lockdown. And the final six month period, that is October 2021 to March 22, was the, was the post COVID period. So this is a three year uh, data that we have from uh, 10 taluks, from 10 districts in Karnataka. So these are the 10, uh, 10 districts that we have uh, mapped here. And you'll see that most of these districts uh, are all from the Southern Karnataka and Central Karnataka, three districts in Central. And uh, as you may know, I may not know that Southern Karnataka and Central Karnataka are definitely better performing than Northern Karnataka. So, so that is where our data is a little skewed because uh, these are a result of RTI uh, applications. And actually, we had sent to all districts, but this is what we got. So this is what we have analyzed. Uh, let's have a quick uh, background on the nutrition status um, uh, of the districts. For uh, uh, this one, we see that the Karnataka average is marked in red. Um, we see that when you look at underweight and wasted children, uh, two districts stand out as having the most number of wasted uh, and uh, more wasted children, that is Chikmagluru and Kodagu. Uh, Chikmagluru and Kodagu are the ones with the highest number of wasted children, but the highest number of underweight children is in Gadag and Haveri. So, uh, so data is this way, but, uh, but most taluks are better performing than the Karnataka average. That is what we see here. Um, let us look at uh, what we saw, saw in terms of beneficiary profile. Now, this beneficiaries are, like John mentioned, zero to six, uh, uh, six months to three year olds, three years to six year olds, and pregnant and lactating women are our beneficiaries, and they are all part of the SNP program. Uh, so, beneficiary is basically who have received SNP or supplementary nutrition, or in case of COVID, take home rations. Um, we see here is that um, from for this three uh, for the first first year the pre-COVID year the average number of uh, total average number of beneficiaries is about 1.4 lakhs of the 10 taluks put together, uh, of which the highest uh, uh, number of beneficiaries are of the six months to three year age group. 
followed by the three year to six years, and of course, pregnant and lactating women form the smallest uh, percent of beneficiaries. We also would say that uh, of this, the Bangalore South, we are actually in Bangalore North, Bangalore South has the largest number of Anganwadi centers in our sample, 499. And they also um, have 499. While uh, if you see down NR Pura or Narsingapura, Chikmagluru has the lowest number of Anganwadi centers in our sample. They also have the lowest uh, beneficiary ratio uh, for the Anganwadi. There are only 27 beneficiaries per Anganwadi there. But uh, it was uh, in Gadak, Sri Hatti in Gadak, which has 82 beneficiaries per Anganwadi center, which are the highest, followed by Bangalore South. So this is uh, just a quick uh, 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 explanation, saying that, again, like I already explained, that zero to six month old, uh, six months to three years old are the uh, most uh, number of beneficiaries we found in that age group while pregnant and lactating women are the lowest uh, uh, beneficiary group. Um, and what I would like you to notice is that um, the in pregnant and lactating, which is in purple, uh, that uh, like Kodagu, Ponampet, Bangalore South, and Udupi had the lowest percentage of this, so 4% to 6%, while the highest was around 18% in other taluks. So that was on pre-COVID numbers. Post-COVID, um, if you look at the three six month in uh, six month periods in between, that is the first wave and lockdown in between the first and second wave and the second and second wave and lockdown period, you see that there has this is a uh, this is a table showing percent change in number of beneficiaries. We see that the number of beneficiaries in total has increased in all taluks. Uh, especially in the first wave and between the first and the second wave. There are slight decreases in the second wave you see in one or two taluks. Now, that was with all beneficiaries together. If we look at particularly um, six month to three year beneficiaries, it is very different. We see that in the first wave, in fact, five taluks have shown a decrease in number of beneficiaries, uh, change, decrease in number of beneficiaries in six month to three year age group. And you see that uh, there is an increase in between the two waves, then there is followed by a decrease again, that is showed uh, in green in the second wave, right? Then uh, for three to six year olds, you see that there has been an increase, consistent increase through all, throughout the COVID period, okay? Except for Bangalore South and Hirekarur in Haveri, you see that it, there has been a consistent increase in three to six year old beneficiaries. But the most surprising is the pregnant and lactating women. Actually, it is an increase. But three taluks have shown so much of an increase, a 300% increase in Udupi, in um, Kodagu, and a 120% increase in Bangalore South. Now, I would uh, like you to recall that these were the three districts or taluks which had actually shown a very low number of beneficiaries of pregnant and lactating women in the pre-COVID period. And these are the three taluks that have shown a very high increase. But that doesn't mean that there was no increase. In fact, all of them have shown an increase. And that increases, increases most in the first wave. Uh, before this, we, in the MPR, or the monthly progress report, that each uh, taluk, uh, each Anganwadi has in the four co co uh, collated at the taluk level, you also have data on weights, or the percentage of, or the number of children who are underweight, and severely underweight. Uh, so the, so the, uh, tables uh, go as normal children with normal weight, ch children who are moderately underweight, and children who are severely underweight. So uh, what we have done is we have tried to plot uh, the uh, number of children who are moderately underweight here, because uh, the number of severely underweight was very less. Uh, so I mean about 30, 40. So we thought this was a better representation. Um, so we see that uh, the number of um, moderately underweight children has actually gone down in all taluks. And it is uh, more visible in Srihatti, in, in Bangalore South, Ponampet, where actually the numbers are high, but then they all have gone down. We can go to the next slide. This is the same, um, this is a, it's not the same pattern, but a very similar one, where uh, during the pre-COVID period, you see the numbers are such, but in three taluks, the number of children who are moderately underweight who are three to six-year-olds increases with 
say between uh, in in COVID period once in between. But then again, this is only seen in three taluks. It's not seen in all of the taluks. Everywhere it's again going down. That leads us to believe that uh, I mean, how is it possible, right? We have had all news reports, and John has talked about it, about you know how food was scarce. Um, and uh, women were not eating well, children were not getting food, livelihood loss. And you know we have various articles that talk about it. We have also seen in the earlier data that, um, in the Taluk data that zero to six, uh, six months to three year olds, uh, you know, were not, um, were not taking benefic benefits during the first wave or the second wave. We saw it in at least in five Taluks in the earlier data. Um, so how is that the weight of the children is going down or the number of children with mo who are moderately underweight, severely underweight is going down? So that is something um, um, we want to ask. There's also another evidence that we did an earlier study at CVPS where we have gone to the field in 2022 and talked to stakeholders, talked to mothers, we've talked to uh, Anganwadi supervisors who have told us that there were definite periods where weight monitoring was not happening, nutritional counseling was not happening, Anganwadis were shut down. So how is that, that you're having a, law, a decrease in number of children who are underweight? There's an also another issue when we look at data. Look at, um, we, I would like you to focus on the uh, NFHS data on the lower, the second last column, which shows the percent of underweight children under five years in 2019-20 according to NFHS district level data. You can look at that line and look at the pre-COVID numbers above for the same. So these are the one below is district level, while the one above is taluk level. There are two things going on here. One is that taluk level data seems to be extreme underestimate. While they are of the same district, how can it be so underestimated? Or is, is this taluk very different from the district, within the district itself? So these are the two questions when we have, when we look at MPR data and when we look at national level data. And um, so like, so this is what uh, we'd like to discuss is that we see that from our analysis, our preliminary analysis, we see that there's a definite demand for supplementary nutrition in times of COVID, but we see that this demand is different with different beneficiary groups. There is a definite increase in three to six year age group who have wanted this. And this we are seeing also in education too, where enrollment in schools have, government schools have increased, enrollment in Anganwadis have increased. Maybe this is something for uh, ECD. And finally, PLW also, huge increase in pregnant and lactating women. We have Matrapurna in Karnataka. Why is that, that they were not accessing in pre-COVID? Why are they doing it during COVID times? So what is it that's driving them towards? That is on the beneficiary itself. This is on the weight data. Uh, I mean, Nanganwadi worker, poor thing, she is collecting data on weight. Uh, but I mean, how is, use, is this data useful? And which we will be uploading on Potion Tracker. Uh, because, uh, you know, they are very different from what the literature says, what NFHS says. So what do we do? So this is what our studies. We would welcome your comments on how we can take the study forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I had one question about uh, Potion Tracker. Um, the indicators uh, in the Potion Tracker, who has access to that data and who is using that data? And uh, uh, did you uh, get a chance to look at uh, the portion tracker? Thank you. We did uh, go to the office, uh, WCD office, and look at the portion tracker. Now, portion tracker is actually a work in progress, is what they are saying. Uh, because uh, what happens is now the Anganwadi workers, they have their phones on which they are supposed to be putting on all these data of the various registers that they're having. But what happened in early 2022 is that the phone got cut for whatever reasons of uh, network and reasons of non-payment of dues. So there was no, um, nothing going, put, being input into the phones to upload, be uploaded into Potion Tracker. What they were doing were they were maintaining registers again, another register for Potion Tracker. So again, that needs to be uploaded. So when we visited the office, he said the person who was in charge of 
the portion uh, portion tracker data set he told us or rather the system information system he told us that it is it will take 2 years for them to correct what covid has not and then you know up, updated train them updated have proper phones in which they can capture the data but portion tracker is awesome so many variables and if only it was available just out of curiosity how easy difficult was it accessing this uh, data from you said you uh, got it through rti application yes. so uh, what yeah. was like the timeline and the timeline actually we had done a previous study uh, which we uh, looked at uh, nutrition distribution systems in karnataka in two districts at uh, at uh, taluk level um, uh, it was a more uh, qualitative study from which we kind of understood that uh, you know at taluk level there is so much difference uh, in within a district itself and so from that an idea was born my rx colleague achala and i were involved in that um, that you know let us measure what is a variability of the of two taluks within a district so we have we actually went through district at a glance that is available in karnataka figured out try to figure out which is the best performing taluk and you know worst performing taluk within each district within each of the 30 districts in karnataka and sent out rti applications asking for this mpr data that is the monthly progress report that you have seen for 3 uh, years so the result is that this we got uh, we got full data or rather at least one taluk data from 10 districts and this is what we have uh, analyzed for from the uh, rti data did you have access to any other uh, data generated by local communities or local ngos which you could have uh, sort of compared or you know cross verified any any such attempt has been made no sir but actually if there is something like that i think i should look at it yes i think it's important because many communities they also collect this data and nobody looks at them see sometimes they don't get <laughs> adequate attention and publicity but suppose we as an organization also access that local level data and compared to what government is actually officially publishing it will also give you a lot of credibility in what you are doing i will i will add that there is some data that wcd gets uh, some kind of detailed data from niti ayog and all of that but there's too much reluctance to share it with us wcd at the state level at the state government level uh, wouldn't uh, i mean they finally actually so state government has mpr data at taluk level because all the taluks finally send a data to the district which comes to the state we had requested for the state government also to give us the data but it never came it we followed up multiple times went visits to the office but they never yeah that was we got only of the suggestion yeah. we haven't gone to the north yeah but i think as for part of the sir saying is that there is i think almost one professor strikas speaking about in the morning was that there might be a community angle here in the sense that you might have local ngos who are either engaging with qualitative data collection which then can be sort of seen as at least in understanding the social context in which this is happening and then you know provide certain forms of social context for what the numbers mean i think that's what you mean also community level data might exist at the might exist so might exist at the local panchayat level as well Uh, so that is something that perhaps we can explore to go deep we should put that analysis in tumkur during our peak study yeah for the next we can yes. do it for the next round yes. yes no no i'm saying not i mean i'm saying our study for the next round yes we should do that much more any questions? i just yeah just one thing no what point of these mprs these are administrative things used internally for purposes of monitoring and uh, there is a strange creature called the district minister who occasionally so the it, it, some of them are generated on a need to show basis It's, that's and the officials themselves will be reluctant to share it because the government doesn't consider it as official data it's an internal thing it goes to the planning department which consolidates it and then you will be told that this is the relevant data so it's if you want to do with it unless you have Uh, other ways of knowing that some of it is relevant through you know observational methods or whatever uh, you can use it to get an indication of the way things are going but not more than that 
I had a couple of questions. Uh, you have raised a lot of questions about the data in terms of certain trends that you found unexpected. Do you have interpretations for them or explanations for them? Was the greater utilization of this during the COVID period explained by the fact that their mobility had decreased, their ability to go for their regular occupations might have decreased, their income levels would have decreased, and therefore their dependence on these subsidized supplies would have certainly increased. So that would be a, an explanation one would think. The second is, does the MPR uh, provide you only the report of the analyzed rates or do you have access to the individual data as well of the individual child's data or the mother's data? That is available at the Angad one. Yeah, but you, when you get the MPR, you only get what they have analyzed and reported for that month? The totals of that month, yes. So the reason I am asking is, follow-up of that question is, how do you know this is accurate data? Could this have been, does the MPR stand for monthly progress report or a manipulated progress report? <laughs> so in, if you have the access to the individual data, then you can see if there is a digit preference, if there is an unusually unexpected skewed data distribution, then you can know whether there is actually some sort of a, because they have to submit reports, right? With all the difficulties of the COVID period. So uh, you may want to at least try and access for some subsamples some data sets and see, verify. Bangalore South had low coverage for pregnant and lactating women, Bangalore Urban South. Um, and since you only, yeah, yeah, and since you only looked at ICDS coverage, do you think that could also be because they were maybe relying on state schemes? Because you do have state schemes for take home ration in Karnataka. I'm asking this out of curiosity. The state scheme is through the Anandwadi Center. Okay, so you only looked at state but I thought yeah, it was it is a state scheme. The Marupur okay. means. Okay. So you did say ICDS. So I, I, okay, so it's come back. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. So I'm Astra Karnatran and this is my friend Basha Ray Hasham. We are from Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation, Directorate. So the title of our paper is The Estimation of State Level Poverty Line, Provincializing Calorie Norms in India. So poverty eradication has been not but this methodology has assume that calorie intake requirements remain same across the region for a given period of time. So here, we try to account for the fact that the calorie intake may vary across the region and then estimating the poverty line for the Indian state. So in India, Planning Commission was the nodal agency for the estimation of poverty. Poverty line was estimated in terms of monthly per capita expenditure and has estimated poverty line at national and state level separately for rural and urban areas. The methodology for the estimation of poverty used by the Planning Commission has been based on the recommendation of various working groups, task force or expert groups that consist of eminent experts in the field. So this shows the chronology of different expert groups set up by the Planning Commission from 1962 to 2012. So in 1962, the Planning Commission constituted a working group to find out the desirable minimum level of li living for the population. It recommended rupees 20 per capita per month for rural and 25 per capita per month for urban in terms of 1960-61 prices. So they have excluded expenditure on health and education as it was assumed to be provided by the state. In 1977, a task force was set up under the chairmanship of Dr. Y.K. Alak. They measure poverty by estimating the average calorie requirement for rural and urban separately at national level. And uh, per capita per, per day calorie level was estimated to be 2400 kcal in rural and 2100 kcal in urban areas. So using 1973-74 NSSO data, the poverty line was estimated to be rupees 49 in rural and in urban it was around rupees 56. In 1989, expert group under the chairmanship of Professor D.T. Lakdawala was set up by the Planning Commission and this committee has retained the poverty line defined by the previous committee and disaggregated the national poverty line to state specific poverty lines in order to reflect the interstate price differentials. So in 1994, the urban poverty ratio was 32.4% and rural it was 37.3%. An expert group was set up under the chairmanship of Suresh D. Tendulkar in 2005 and they adopted 2004-5 poverty line of the previous expert group and converted into the MRP consumption. 
So they estimated the urban poverty line to be rupees 578 and rural to be 446. The Rangrajan committee was constituted, constituted in 2011 by the planning commission and the committee has used a modified mixed recall period methodology. So as guided by the recommendation of ICMR, the average requirement of calorie, protein and fats were computed and in rural areas per capita per day requirement of calorie was computed to be 2155 kcal of calories, 48 grams of protein and 28 grams of fat and in urban areas it was 2090 kcal to 50 grams of protein and 26 grams of fat per day. So as I mentioned before they have used a modified uh, mixer recall period and the methodology proposed has three components. The first is the food, comp food component and second is the basic norm normative expenditure for the basic non-food components which included clothing, footwear, education, institutional medical care and durable goods and the third component is the other non-food expenses. Uh, so they have arranged the uh, entire household population. So the entire household population was divided into fractals and the fractal that satisfied the minimum requirement was identified. So this, uh, they have uh, the summation of MPC of the fractal for food and the third component that is the non-basic food components and the expenditure MPC of the median fractal for the basic non-food gave the poverty line. So accordingly the poverty line for rural area was estimated to be rupees 972 and in urban area it was rupees 1407. So the major criticism that rose against the methodology are the behavioral dilemma caused by the methodology in calculating poverty as this MPC was sum, uh, the summation of MPC belonging to two different fractals uh, lead to the complete, like, it, it has resulted in the sum, summation of two entirely different basket of goods. The pricing of non-food essentials the, and their consumption will differ largely across regions while the food basket is to an extent normalized by the ICMR recommendation. The committee also uses Fisher Index in its calculation which is highly sensitive to variations in uh, prices and population multiplier and reducing these complexities into simple summation will not be able to show the true extent of poverty. So we cannot say that all India poverty line is a weighted average of the state poverty lines. So our motivation of our study is that the discourse on poverty once at the epicenter of debate in Indian academia is now pushed to the margin despite India's distinction of having largest number of poor in the world. So the latest committee on measurement of poverty has calculated rural Kerala's poverty to be mere 7.3% in 2011-12 which seemed to be quite low compared to what everyday experience of living in Kerala would reveal. So for the nutritional requirement or the minimum calorie norm has been defined at national level. Thus the study raises a fundamental criticism to the entire class of poverty measures that has been proposed so far in the Indian context that is they have assumed that the calorie level remains constant across the states. So our criticism emanates from the fact that calorie requirement itself may be different for different states as has been revealed by the literature on calorie puzzle debate in India kick started by Dieter Nandres. So the objectives of our first study are to calculate the calorie adjusted state level poverty lines for major states and also to find the percentage of poverty that population that falls below the poverty line. So why do we need a state adjusted calorie norm? So the Indian states have diverged, have diverged in their growth and development due to various reasons like different, differential investment on education infrastructure that have resulted for some states to have a high per capita income and increased mechanization of their economies. So the conventional wisdom would indicate that high con uh, higher per capita income would result in a higher consumption of food. But what we can observe in the Indian case is the contradiction of this con uh, convention. So the literature has shown that an increase in the income has is with a consistent temporal decrease with the per capita calorie intake. So for data, the data used in the study is the Household Consumption Expenditure Survey brought out by the NSS of the 68th round for the year 2011-12. And uh, this was used to re-estimate the state's specific poverty lines. We have also used per capita gross state domestic product from EPWRF. And uh, the selected states were Haryana, Maharashtra, Kerala, etc. as you can see in the slide. And these states have been ranked according to their per capita GSDP. And in the study, we find the state-specific poverty lines of the rural sector because uh, we focus over here on rural poverty and it is still a work in progress. So we see a diverse sort of mechanization in agriculture across time. And this is why we've selected rural for the beginning stage. So over here, you can see the methodology is uh, for the state-specific calorie norms. Uh, they have been derived 
from Siddiqui and Rahman, it is a forthcoming paper wherein they have estimated the deviation in minimum calorie requirement from national level norm, uh, that is 2155 KKL for the rural areas. And for examining the role of contextual factors like epidemiological environment, health infrastructure and mechanization of the state economies, they use a multi-level model that allows for exploring the independent but unobserved effects of state level factors on calorie intake. So uh, I will not be focusing too much on their uh, core methodology, but what they've done is they've nested uh, these uh, values according to individual level, um, then village level, district level, and state level, and found out whether, uh, so the basic idea is that individual in a particular state will be more similar compared to individuals of different states. So this is the crux of the methodology. Over here, you can see the first equation. It gives the conversion of individual level minimum dietary energy requirement to household level by using age and sex of the household members along with the activity status of the household. And the second equation over here shows the state adjusted MDER, which accounts for the variation in the contextual environments of the states. And you can see S1K and S2K are the contextual or macro uh, environment variables. S1 dash is the rural India level mean prevalence rate of infections. And S2 dash is uh, rural mean MPC, monthly per capita expenditure of India, representing the national level mean of S1K and S2K. And household size is given by HH size. And these uh, terms are multiplied. The second term of the right-hand side is multiplied with the household size because it is required for the regression uh, coefficient uh, that is derived from using per capita calorie intake as dependent variable. So now we see how the states differ in calorie requirement in rural India is, uh, as you can see, the table one gives the state-wise deviation no, uh, from uh, national level calorie norm for average person in rural areas, that is 2155 KCAL. For each state, you either add or subtract these values to arrive at a uh, close to optimum uh, value of calorie requirement that each state uh, uh, has, and it varies because of their own uh, typical characteristic, which is taken into account through the regression equation. So for results, uh, we see here that uh, we've ranked the states according to the per capita GSDP and this table shows the state-wise poverty line and the corresponding incidence rates, rates based on different formulas. So the first one is uh, what the Rangarajan committee has reported. The second one would be national formula with national calorie uh, norm which is being applied for each state and then next one is what we need to focus on which is national formula with state adjusted calorie norm. So as you can see, the higher uh, income uh, earning states over here have, uh, you can see there's a decrease in the intake of calorie when we move to the national level uh, to the state adjusted calorie, while for the lower income earning states such as Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh, you can see that it uh, in fact increases, it's the opposite. And also the percentage of poverty uh, for higher income earning states, you can see is uh, decreasing and also for uh, the lower income earning states it is increasing so this shows a truer picture of uh, what uh, the lived realities of the states and it has been computed from the nss uh, consumption expenditure survey data as i've mentioned so the policy implications of this would be to bring about a more targeted procedure for the identification of the vulnerable population who may be at risk of malnutrition due to poverty and providing a more accurate measure of poverty that would improve policy making notifying the policy makers about the minimum daily calorie intake necessary for basic nutrition in each state and uh, to help them form tailor-made policies to tackle poverty at the state level to bring about more nuanced anti-poverty programs that would target the vulnerable population by adjusting the poverty lines lower or higher as per the characteristics of the state and as a result, the government can allocate resources in an efficient and effective manner, or we can say resource optimization, as uh, it was mentioned in the morning. So the limitation, uh, the biggest limitation of the study is that the current data uh, or the latest data of CES is not available as such. And also uh, the state adjusted poverty lines for now, we have calculated only for the rural sector. 
and conclusion so the rangarajan committee has calculated the minimum nutritional requirement based on the dietary allowance recommended by icmr at national level and even though the committee have suggested for the state level price differentials to calculate the poverty lines they have not accounted for the difference in calorie intake level across the states and until calorie needs are defined at regional level arriving lo at logically consistent poverty line or estimate would always be a challenging task and there will always be an inherent assumption that uh, will be untenable with reality so continued the diversity among the indian states has resulted in the development at varying levels leading a uh, few states like kerala tamil nadu to perform better in public health and human development indicators it was also found that unlike bihar and uttar pradesh states of kerala and tamil nadu require lower calorie consumption and this is not because of the lack of affordability but partly due to an infectious free environment these differences must be taken into account while estimating poverty at the state level and therefore this paper aims to arrive at a poverty line that is as per the state adjusted calorie norm for the purpose of tackling the ca calorie consumption puzzle observed among the indian states thank you and it's a superbly presented and it's absolutely accurate so Thank congratulations so on that you've also done very well you've also done very well in staying away from what individual scholars have done with this data you know you could read minas you could read nathan you could read surjit bhalla and they will drive you mad because estimates of poverty range from something like 80% of the population to 6% i think using the same database with various so in a sense it would be pointless to get into that debate i'll need more time to really digest what you've done properly but it's an interesting methodology to get the state adjusted calorific uh, thing now one point you mentioned the dress diet and study that's not the first there was a debate in epw in the 1970s between pv sukhatme and we carry it out Sukhatne was making the point that the typical Indian diet that we have will be at most 1600 kcal, and that therefore you should calculate it on that basis, and that using the higher norm was not. And Vikar Rao's position was that these are uh, accepted by the medical and health authorities, and I'm not going to question them. Anyway, whatever it is worth, it'll complete your survey by putting that in. Now the point that you make. I don't know why you've gone into the interstate issue because that raises a lot of very more complicated issues. Uh, at the moment you say things like UP needs more because of infectious environment, then the whole thing will blow up. But that same logic applies to the regions within Kerala. So can you do this saying by either way? I don't know how you categorize Kerala, north, south, middle, or district or whatever, hilly, coastal. I don't know. but it would be interesting to do that and i would like to know whatever percentage you get from this the state administration has its own way of distributing benefits through the poverty surveys done by rural development what is the difference between that and this because this is a no complaint from kerala that the planning commission methodology always underestimates poverty in kerala because they do well in health education and things like that and this affects the flow of funds from the center it's political to that extent but i'm not convinced about your interstate but an intra district maybe would be much more valuable and that would be within the powers of the kerala government okay thank you very much i again appreciate the presentation it's superb thank you thank you i have just one general suggestion not only to you to all the presenters but you are all young people you will be presenting in a number of conferences when you put a powerpoint presentation don't read from there see that distracts the attention of everyone from what you are saying so only put some highlights some bullet points you have your own lecture notes here and read from that so that people look at you and not look at the screen that is very important you know because otherwise the message that you are giving out you are giving so fast it will be lost on half of the audience so it's better that you keep it concise put minimum uh, number of lines on the on the screen and read from your notes i think that is the best way of presentation otherwise as dr vyasulai said this is absolutely 
excellent uh, research and presentation thank you uh, it's just a comment um, open for uh, discussion uh, from uh, the panel also um, I don't know if this is entirely linked to the study, but uh, there's uh, the silent increase of obesity among the southern states, which is a point of concern when we talk about calorie intakes, and especially among uh, children uh, under five. And uh, even the latest NFHS uh, uh, data shows that uh, there's increase in obesity among the southern states. So uh, this is, I think, also something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, that when we talk about policy and things. Right? Well, I'll take the first cr crack to prove the adage that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So, firstly, childhood obesity is an increasing problem. But how we define obesity is a problematic area. Basically, obesity, even among adults, has been based on body mass index measurement. Even in children, it's based on the distribution of the body mass index rather than absolute cutoffs. But nevertheless, there is a measure which is dependent on body mass index. However, that's a very inaccurate measure for the simple reason that body mass index relates height to weight but doesn't give you a measure of total body fat or distribution of body fat, which is actually obesity in terms of its metabolic implications and disease causation. So you could have a large muscle mass or a large, uh, a fair amount of bone weight which gives you a high BMI but you're not obese. On the other hand, you could be relatively thin but have a large amount of body adiposity, particularly distributed in the abdomen, visceral adiposity, which is actually highly inflammatory associated with a large number of metabolic abnormalities and which predisposes you to disease. So the measure of obesity is incorrect at the moment. In children, it's better taken by waist to height ratio. But the waist is some measure of visceral adiposity. And height, anyway, you're measuring as part of BMI. So waist to height ratio is a better indicator. If you want to do body adiposity, then you'll have to go in for impedance studies and all that, which is not going to be really easy. So waist to height ratio is easily done. The second element is why is it happening? Part of it is because of the so-called thrifty phenotype, where pregnancy related undernutrition of the mother during the pregnancy, in fact, the undernutrition may start from the girl child. If the girl child is undernourished, she'll have a small pelvis, smaller placenta, less bl placental blood flow to the fetus. But during pregnancy itself, the mother may be undernourished. And therefore, the child gets much less nutrition, the infant. But the child could have a stillbirth or the child may survive. I'm sorry if I have to give a little explanation. Now, if the child has to survive, it has to conserve its energy, the fetus. It does so by reducing its muscle mass, reducing its organ size, so that the available calories are preserved for growth of the brain and the nervous system, which is essential for survival. And then the child is born, and then you may have undernutrition even in the early first two years. But then when you get even relative increase in nutrition, need not be really overnutrition within quotes, there's a mismatch between what you have been physiologically and metabolically programmed for and what you are now receiving. And that mismatch, which was originally intended for survival, but now is a different environment, results in storage of body fat. Because fat is a reserve energy you can call upon, whereas the muscle burns up sugar fast. So you are actually trying to conserve energy for survival even then. So your muscle mass is less. And therefore what I'm saying is, you put on weight, put on fat more than weight. And that is actually the real problem of childhood obesity. But where you are actually getting into overt obesity, where you are actually, even your BMI is increasing, there, apart from this, much more importantly is excess consumption of calories relative to calorie expenditure, which is physical 
uh, in a, in activity. So a combination of uh, large, high calorie rich foods, particularly ultra processed foods and others, and low levels of physical activity, they actually result in a energy intake expenditure imbalance and that's causing a fair amount of problem. Now that is the overall explanation. If you want to get deeper, then of course what happens at the level of pregnancy and infancy and that whole thing is epigenetically mediated where the gene expression is modified. But you also are now recognizing there's a microbiome, trillions of microbes living in your gut. They feed on your fiber. What you are not digesting, they are eating. Therefore, if you are eating ultra-processed foods shorn of fiber, you are not giving them the right food, so you are getting the wrong microbiome. And they can actually cause obesity and inflammation. So there are multiple mechanisms which are responsible for current rise in child obesity globally as well as in India. What you have done is, you know, I mean, I think, uh, some, like I said, I'll, I'll echo everyone. It's very crisp. Uh, and we'd be interested to know, as Professor Vyaslu suggested, what the interstate um, conversation looks like. But I would also like to, I think, have a conversation around the, the, I think, either the historicity or the relevance of calorie norms and poverty line and what that means currently in the kinds of conversation that we have, with, especially with respect to post-COVID world. The first thing I want to say is that we have to see it in the context of the way we functioned after independence. We did not have much of data. We decided on the Planning Commission plan rate of growth. And in the absence of hard census data, uh, Professor Mahanobe has devised a system of surveys. And most of these surveys at that point in time were intended to answer very broad questions like which are the poverty hotspots what kind of strategy should be followed in the, those and other places and so on. There was also a belief that this was a socialist society and uh, the state would give education, the state would give schools and so on. And at that point in time, poverty basically meant you didn't have food to eat. So the Vikar Virao 1961 concept of it said, what is the minimum amount you need to keep body and soul together? So it's trying to estimate those who are non-dead, but who are not really functioning, and therefore in need of help. Once that came out, uh, and it was a time when the economics profession was growing and all of us needed to publish, there was data, there was controversy, and all kinds of things started happening. Now the reports that you saw were efforts to rationalize it for purposes of planning. But what actually happened was that when you tried to implement those plans, the NSS planning commission estimates meant for planning purposes were then getting converted into how union funds were transferred for certain purposes. Then the money that came to the states, how were the states to spend it? Now they could not go by these averages that were used in the surveys. So it was handed over to the rural development departments under the belief that poverty is rural. And therefore they ran their own surveys to identify the poor. And what happened was, and this happened in every state, the number of identified households was two to three times more than the planning commission numbers. But what the poverty lines estimated was this very narrow thing that we went. What the state rural development things did for their own motives was first to eliminate what are non-poor. So the question that were asked would be, do you have a pakka house, do you have a bicycle, do you have a Depending on the time it was done, do you have a transistor radio? Now, I don't know if that question still remains. <laughs> but now I suppose they'll ask, do you have a smartphone? But whatever it is, you eliminate a large number because the moment you say you have a bicycle, you're taken to be non-poor. It's not necessarily true. N.S. Joda did an extremely detailed study where he said poverty lines consume income with uh, wealth in the sense of household assets. And what happens is that somebody is working for us, we have an old bicycle, we give it to them. So they have a bicycle, but it doesn't mean that they're not poor. So all these kind of things started happening. But we did not take Joda's distinction about household assets, and every start, state started doing this. So two things were happening. One was that deserving poor got eliminated because of these kind of criteria. 
and those that remained were desperately poor, but those numbers were much more than the all India ratios that the government was using. Hence the stress for these state level estimates. The state level estimates didn't very help very much, mainly because the NSS samples, they large, they run into lakhs of households. But when it came to each state, they were the minimum required to draw a valid statistical assumption. And these were done for major states. For example, for Goa, the, all the numbers are average between Maharashtra and Karnataka, which are the neighboring states. So what does Goa do with this kind of, I mean, they can even disclaim it. But this is the way the political economy has functioned. So the only summary I can say is, we have, as a country, we have the richest literature on poverty. There's no doubt about it. And for work that was done in the Indian Statistical Institute, Planning Commission, Professor Mahal Nobis and so on, Angus Deaston got a Nobel for publishing analyzed results, but without acknowledging that people like Nikhilaj Bhattacharya and others had already done that and published in Sankhya. So that's the way things go. Who has been a, a programmer and an implementer all my life, this uh, particular norm, like a poverty line, it doesn't really ring a bell. It may be necessary for a researcher, for an organization like Niti Aayog or Planning Commission to set in certain standards. But ultimately, what matters for governments is the question of providing access to services. So, if you define, as you said, just because a person has a bicycle, you can't say that he is not poor anymore, so you deny all other services. I think basically this is a micro level activity. You need to define the populations who are in need of services. Which section of population needs what services? Who needs more of health, who needs more of education, more of nutrition? And provide those services. I think that's how government has to function. Not just on the basis of some macro indicators like a poverty line, etc., which, which varies not only from state to state, from district to district. How can you make that a, 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 a baseline, you know, or a target for providing services, for focusing services? That is my main objection. So I think, okay, you can have any amount of debate on poverty lines, but I think government plans and government programmers should focus more on access issues and defining those vulnerable populations who are marginalized, who are in need of your services, not in terms of total coverage. If you say universal health coverage, somebody says they have assumed 90% coverage, but you will see that 10% who are left out are the most needy. So coverage is not the issue. I think it is access which is the issue which should be the basis, basis, I think, basis for any government programming. So that's why I will feel it. Thank you. I am Arun Kumar uh, from RV University. Uh, further to this concept of uh, measurement of poverty based on caloric uh, value, uh, as Professor has already pointed out, there are a lot many development that has, the, that has happened. Once, uh, one such is the basically development of a deprivation index. Probably you would have seen that. So uh, rather than uh, uh, you, are, you really assess uh, the situation in terms of energy, you try to see uh, poverty from a broader perspective, not merely from the perspective of energy requirement. Uh, for example, access to income, access to employment, access to health. And perhaps that will go further to uh, as an extension to the development index, HDI, from there it will move forward. So uh, I think uh, some of the advanced countries are presently using a composite deprivation index as a substitute to measurement of the poverty. Perhaps this kind of a study, rather than simply using those uh, our, our age-old uh, things that the professor was telling, uh, that perhaps a much more a composite, all-encompassing index kind of uh, composite index, deprivation index can be used. Distance to a lot of papers are there in this direction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tina D'Souza, and this is my co-author, Yukti Jain. So our paper is titled, Investigating the Challenges to Urban Sanitation Workers' Welfare, a case study analyzing Hosur City Municipal Corporation, um, Tamil Nadu, India. So we are focusing on the uh, the plight of sanitation workers in India, and we are using um, the case study of uh, host HCMC, Hosur Municipal Corporation, which is taken from a previous study done by CBPS. 
So I'd like to start off uh, with a quick definition of sanitation. This is taken from the National Urban Sanitation Policy of 2008. So sanitation is defined as the safe management of human excreta, including its safe confinement, treatment, disposal, and associated hygiene-related practices. Um, I'd also like to clarify here that we are focusing on sanitation and not solid-based management in this paper. Um, so this is a quick timeline of um, sanitation um, efforts in regard to urban sanitation in India. So if we look uh, in the post-independence period, um, sanitation has always been a priority for India right since the beginning. Um, even in the first five-year plan, water, and uh, water supply and sanitation was added to the national agenda. But when you look at the documents, they mostly talk about rural sanitation. And uh, uh, not a lot of investment was made in this area up until the 1980s. And it's only since then that we see that investment starts picking up. So one of the first major schemes we see related to urban sanitation is the integrated low-cost low sanitation scheme. So uh, this scheme aimed to eliminate the practice of night soil carrying, which is an extremely dehumanizing uh, process. And after that, we see, I will go over these schemes in a little more detail later. The National Water Policy of 1987, it was again uh, revised in 2002 and then uh, 2012. But when we look at this, um, so the 87 and the 2012 version talk about sanitation, but it's in just passing. So there is no mention regarding the welfare of sanitation workers or even acknowledgement of the practice of manual scavenging. And you might argue that this is a policy related to water, why would this be covered here? But uh, if you want to improve the sanitation conditions of the country, you would have to improve the kind of, um, you know, the sanitation systems available. And that also um, is connected to improving the welfare of sanitation workers, which is why I'm mentioning this. Uh, the next very major landmark development is the 74th Constitutional Amendment, which introduces urban self-government in India. And the 12th schedule of the Constitution uh, brings public health, sanitation, conservancy, and solid waste management as one of the 18 items that come under the purview uh, of uh, municipal governments. So that's when we see that a lot of efforts were being made. Uh, now, now, like there was somebody who was actually responsible for um, the welfare of sanitation and sanitation workers in the country. Yeah, so the 1993 Act, the Prohibition of Employment of Manual Scavengers um, Act, that was another major act. And as a result of that, you see a lot of schemes coming up. There are schemes related to rural sanitation, but I'm focusing on urban sanitation, which is why I'll skip forward to 2007 where we see the SRMS, so uh, the self-employment scheme for uh, rehabilitation of manual scavengers. This scheme um, tried to improve the living livelihood conditions and the opportunities for alternate employment for manual scavengers. So um, they were offered things like one-time cash assistance and free skilling in, a cho in any alternate uh, profession of their choice and a monthly stipend when they go undergo all this training. After that, we go to the National Urban Sanitation Policy, which also you know, reiterates that we need to improve the welfare of sanitation workers. Um, the next is Swachh Bharat Mission, which again, um, uh, talks about improving the welfare of sanitation workers. I do not want to go much over these schemes because um, I want to look at the uh, main issues facing sanitation workers, whereas these schemes are mainly looking at sanitation itself. And the welfare of workers is only mentioned in passing. So then you have Namaste, which I will explain later. It's the latest scheme introduced in 2022. We do not have a detailed policy document for it yet. So when you look at the plight of sanitation workers, I'd like to start out by uh, saying that first of all, this is not just an issue concerning sanitation, but as you keep looking at the data, you realize that it's also a human rights issue. And um, when you look at uh, the data that we get, this, so this is taken from the, the answer to a question in parliament. If you look at the uh, caste distribution of sanitation workers, you see that uh, the workers overwhelmingly belong to a certain category of certain um, groups of castes of people. 
So you see that 97.3% of the workers belong to scheduled castes, and you have less than 1% of them who belong to scheduled tribes, 1% um, other backward classes, and the, uh, again, it's a very small percentage which belong to other um, cl class categories. So also, again, when uh, you come back to the reason I'm talking about this is there is a severe underestimation of the number of sanitation workers you have. So when you look at the data that we got from the socioeconomic and caste census of 2011, um, the number of manual scavengers that was estimated based on self-reporting by people was 1,82,505. But um, a basis of the 2013 Act, when, pe when they tried to go and verify the actual status of these uh, people, the official numbers that the government releases is 58,098 workers. And this is only from 17 states of India. So this is as of December 2021. Out of these, um, so there's another uh, survey that talks about how only 4,609 workers are in urban areas. So the data relating to this is quite messy. Um, there is a lot of contradiction. When you see the number of workers who were verified uh, in terms of percentage to make it easier, it's 31.83% of the workers out of the number who were self-reported are the ones who have been identified by the government. Another argument that could come here is that I'm mostly talking about manual scavengers when my presentation is saying that we're looking at sanitation workers' welfare. So the reason we are doing this is when you look at uh, how the sanitation ecosystem of a lot of our cities is, you realize that a lot of sanitation workers end up do, uh, performing manual scavenging. So I shall uh, substantiate this point with further when I take the example of Hosur. So again, this is a review of the social security measures. Like I'd already mentioned, the SRMS scheme provides a one-time cash assistance of 40,000 rupees. You have skill development. You have loans for them to take up uh, entrepreneurial ventures after they get trained. And um, there's also a scheme to assist with uh, procuring sanitation equipment. So when you look at the dashboard for SRMS and how much has actually been done by, uh, by the scheme, so they say that 1,031 projects have been sanctioned, 8.04 crore rupees have been sanctioned as subsidy amount, uh, 13,407 uh, manual scavengers have received skill development training, uh, 271 of them have um, uh, benefited from health camps. But again, uh, this data keeps changing across different places on the same ministry's website. So there is a lot of inconsistency in data. Uh, Hosur, quickly introducing, it is, a, uh, it is in Krishnagiri district of Tamil Nadu. It's an industrial hub. It has a lot of manufacturing and automobile units. And it is in, uh, lo located very close to uh, Bangalore. Now we're looking at Hosur CMC. So it was recently upgraded to a city municipal corporation in 2019. And if you look at the data, 5%, uh, so this is uh, according to the 2011 census data, 5% of them live in slums, 98% have access to individual toilets, there are only 20% who have uh, access to a drainage connection. So this is the organization structure of Hosur. Um, sanitation comes under the public health section, and there are also parastatals which um, are involved in their work. So this is where I want to make a case about how the sanitation ecosystem flows. So it starts out with water being supplied by the Hoganakal water supply project and by public bore wells and such. Uh, then uh, it goes to individual households, it goes to community toilets. Um, uh, also to be noted that except for the private layouts, no other part of uh, the Hosur CMC has access to underground drainage system. So all of this uh, goes to septic tanks or directly to uh, open close or stormwater drains. So from the, from the households itself, uh, uh, you see that the water, both the black water and gray water, gets mixed up and enters the septic tank and also uh, the stormwater drains. Uh, community toilets separate grey water and black water. Grey water goes to the stormwater drain, black water goes to septic tanks, but eventually the septic tanks empty out into the stormwater drains. So these stormwater drains are uh, maintained by both the permanent staff of the ULB as well as by the uh, outsourced private labour. So when you go by the definition of manual scavenging that you know it is when they make contact with human fecal matter, you see that eventually um, they are uh, engaged in manual scavenging. So uh, 
that is a huge issue I feel that needs to be addressed. So this one is again going back to the uh, benefits available to the various workers in Hosur. So we have three kinds of workers. We have permanent workers who are part of the ULB staff. You have workers outsourced from private agencies. And you have those who are mostly involved in uh, operating suction machines. And they uh, are on a contract basis. So the type of uh, work the permanent staff do, they clean the open drains. Uh, and so does the uh, private uh, labor. Whereas, like I told, the uh, contractual private labor is involved in desludging. So if you look at the uh, difference in salary, you can see that uh, these people have a fixed salary every month, whereas the private workers do not have a minimum wage. Uh, they do not have official days off. They do not have, um, like, you know, sometimes they even have to work during the weekends, especially during the monsoon season. Um, so their rights, there's very little guarantee to their rights. The, so it, that's what I'm trying to say in conclusion. So now I'll uh, give it over to you. Uh, the workers, the sanitation workers which are working in the private sector do not have wealth and health and welfare security as much as the workers who are there in government sector and they form the majority of the uh, total number of workers that are working in the sanitation sector. So this shows, this is a... Uh, uh, this shows the, how Husur has employed. So the blue color shows that the number of uh, private sanitation workers employed by private agencies in every sector there is. So you can see that the numbers are uh, substantially more. Uh, this can be seen, this change was actually came from 1999 when total sanitation campaign was launched. There was a renewed focus on new public management techniques which came to uh, which meant that introduction of private sector management techniques to public sector organizations, which meant engaging with more and more private sector organizations and uh, to, to ensure efficiency, effectiveness, accountability. That was the idea of it. But, and with uh, Swachh Bharat Abhyan, uh, introduction of Swachh Bharat Abhyan in 2014, there was a renewed focus on this style of management. Uh, the private sector participation was, there was a renewed focus on it through tax exemptions, subsidies, grants, regulatory support, and also to involve uh, pri uh, private sector organizations to, through Swachh Bharat Kosh. So uh, essentially what was happening was that ULBs were engaging with these uh, pr uh, private sector organization through performance based contracts or outsourcing or public private partnership which they were they do not have capacity to engage in an efficient manner in which led to a lot of uh, issues in terms of for the uh, workers that were working in that sector so when you talk about when you, when your focus is on cost cutting and improving profitability and efficiency so the downside of it is that it leads to lower wages for the workers. There's lack of job security. There is overemphasis on targets and metrics. There's limited participation in decision making, poor working conditions over time, reduced benefits for the workers. What we were trying to do was we were trying to bring in efficiency and effectiveness, but it led to uh, improve increase in inequalities. Uh, for sanitation workers. So we kind of identified in Husur that there were two major problems uh, that, that was causing uh, this increase in inequality, which was one was the failure of these multi-level governance structures. So when you say that we have a 74th uh, amendment is there and the uh, responsibility to uh, for sanitation is for ULBs, but ULBs do not actually have that kind of uh, uh, they have to work with state government and central governments to deliver uh, that s service and they do not have enough power uh, uh, to make the rules, decision making. So there are, they have limited resources, fragmentation of responsibilities is there, political interference is well known, inadequate capacity and expertise with at the ULB level. So, and it also is linked with uh, dearth in financial capital with ULBs, which is why the focus is there because we want private capital to come to ULBs. ULBs should have their own source of own source of revenues, and they should be able to spend it as they wish because they are actually responsible and they are um, they can engage with the community more. So 
Yes, private sector participation in sanitation is important. It is not going anywhere. The focus is going to be there for reasons which are evident, which is efficiency, effectiveness, and we need profit. We need the sanitation sector to be profitable. Uh, so, even in this uh, speech of uh, uh, finance minister, the recent budget speech, she mentioned that there's going to be a focus on results-based framework, adoption of results-based framework in different sectors, and sanitation sector is the one, which means that they are, uh, they are going to link financial rewards to, uh, to the social objectives which the scheme is trying to adopt. So, which means, for example, in Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, uh, since past three years, there was a results-based out outcomes and output based framework was introduced and there in that there was a result criteria for welfare of sanitation workers but the indicator for that criteria was uh, the uh, that the availability of ppp PPV equipments with the sanitation workers because uh, the for the government it is a very political uh, uh, subject manual scavenging is a very political subject so they they want to make sure that the equipments are available with the sanitation workers working on the ground but because the service delivery is actually done by private sector organizations on the ground in husur it, it was seen that uh, uh, ulbs did not have the capacity to foresee or monitor uh, uh, these activities so they have, because the funding is there through Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, so PPP equipments and other equipments are there, but they are not used. And they are the, these things are not monitored on ground that, uh, so the state capacity needs to increase. So through, because there is a shift, shift towards this framework, uh, so what is happening now is that pro, uh, monitoring and evaluation becomes more and more important. Uh, using results information for learning and decision making uh, becomes important and incentives <laughs> to institutionalize the culture of results is there. So that means that there should, when you attract private capital, you need to have data so that it can be monitored and then it can be evaluated and used for decision making procedures, which is not happening because of a lack of institutional capacity. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Take a break, take a breath, and then finish the, finish the presentation. So, yeah. Don't so. Do that side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, what, what I wanted to point out is what, what you said in the morning that evidence leads to equity. And when we talk about equity, we need to need to strengthen our, strengthen our institutions working at the local level with the communities. So this is the point that I wanted to make. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation, Any questions? As you have done the study, so today the tech intervention in manual scavenging is a big, big topic. Robotics are coming in, AI. So what, what you have found that what uh, the author, local authority of CMC is doing about that kind of you know, intervention? Any, any idea? Are they planning to bring robots or some kind of machines in this kind of... No, no, concept. I am talking about the concept. What the, their vision is that they will bring that thing, right? So, as I mentioned uh, in while uh, presenting also that manual scavenging is a political topic and there is push to eradicate it. Political will is definitely there. Money is flowing. But the utilization is not uh, that great. For example, um, in Husur it was noticed that because these, uh, so when you talk about um, uh, privatization in sanitation sector, it is usually done through performance based contracts or public private partnerships or outsourcing to the private sector. And the uh, ULB level uh, do not have that kind of capacity to engage with the private sector in a way um, uh, which is uh, efficient enough and it does not lead to inequity. So there is uh, technological advancements push is there but not happening on ground note. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of one important thing that you've brought to the table which is when you're talking about manual scavenging it's often seen as from a very legal uh, perspective of human rights violations but actually it's a sanitation problem. And it's also a problem of the state in some ways abdicating itself from the responsibility of 
working on sanitation. So where does the state's work end is an important question. And I would question a little bit and push you a little bit on saying the automatic assumption that efficiency can only be achieved from the private sector or that it's only going to be a private sector's role. I think, think about it. Um, also read a little bit about it. Um, it if, if the state, and by state I'm using the term as the state, uh, is responsible for building individual toilets, why is it not responsible for ensuring the maintenance and cleaning of toilets? Um, and you mentioned very importantly the ULBs um, um, as an important aspect. I'd encourage two more things. Um, one is, um, I think one of the biggest challenges when one talks about manual scavenging is that, as you said, it is political, but we don't actually have numbers, even now. We are relying on community data. We are relying on the national um, Safai Karam Chal, um, Chari Andolan. Yes, um, and even um, government's own data varies <laughs> in how many numbers we have. Um, so I'm not fully convinced that we really are, our intent is fully there to actually address the problem. I think often it entails, by not giving visibility on numbers, it's an easy way to say we've eradicated the problem of manual scavenging. Um, so do look at some of that literature out there. It's worth just mentioning it as some of the things you found. Lastly, there's one of the interesting things that came out recently is this new, I don't ask me the full form, but it's the short form is easy to remember, is the Namaste scheme. Um, so as SRMS does not exist and the Namaste scheme has been launched. Um, it has um, interesting elements where it's actually talking about the institutional mechanism. So it's not just about this one-time class assistance, but thinking a little deeper. So in theory, at least, the policy sounded like an interesting one. Uh, Mandating an enumeration project. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's interesting. I think delve a little deeper into that as well, because now is the time when, since it's in the policy stage and formulation stage, it has a lot of good ideas. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to put out more things on the table saying, well, in the, in the implementation of the policy, here are a few things that could be kept in mind um, going forward. But thank you for bringing up the fact that manual scavenging is not just a human rights violation, which it definitely is, but is an actual active sanitation and institutional problem. Thank you, both of you. Um, we talked about figures at the national level, but I was wondering if you'll finally manage to get figures for just Hosur in terms of what is the actual number of people involved in manual scavenging now, and a gender and age breakup. Because to me, those are important to look at which generation is doing this, which genders are doing this, that would be one. Of course, it's very, for me, that's a very important question. Uh, secondly, I think you started off by explaining various schemes, and I'm curious about how these schemes have actually operated in one micro-reality of HOSUR itself. So which schemes have actually worked, which haven't worked, who benefited from the schemes? I can see a lot of potential for doing much more work and taking this forward. Yes, and I think the, the fact that we need technological solutions in terms of drainage systems, et cetera, that's one. We're talking about capital expenditure for drainage systems. We're talking about robots. We're talking about many different things here. But we haven't got an idea of what the actual solution to this is. Is it about more technology? Is it about just building simple drains? We don't need any fancy technology. We just need to connect drains to existing systems. What is it that we're talking about as a solution? Because to me, I'm not getting that larger picture of what is the final solution, right? Um, the last question I had was, how much of this information is actually shared with Safai Karamchari Andolan and others who are working on the ground to eradicate manual scavenging? Thank you, everyone, for your questions and comments. Um, so I think one was Avni spoke about the Namaste scheme. So we, I did try to look for data on it, but all we have right now is a PIB release talking about the scheme, and there's no policy document as such. But it does look very interesting because it is trying to look at um, improving the equipment and infrastructure and using that to improve the um, welfare of sanitation workers, as you said. Um, and I'm also very interested in the fact that they have mandated an enumeration exercise, so we should see how that goes. Um, with regard to manual scavenging in Hosur, um, we did not check for data specifically related to that. We could check. That's a good point. Um, but also, 
when I was trying to look for data related to the manual scan scavenging survey of 2018, um, I tried this in many ways and every time it just keeps taking you to a broken website and I'm not sure whether that is intentional or not. Um, also, regarding uh, the schemes that have worked at Hosur, um, we do not have data on that. Um, again, the, a major issue that we face in this field is the lack of data or, the, or bad data management. Uh, but um, I, could, uh, I had spoken about SRMS earlier. I'll just quickly talk about ILCS. So ILCS, um, it resulted in uh, 873 sub-schemes covering 2,093 towns in 23 states. Um, so this was the result as of 31st March 2009, because after that, um, the scheme was revised again. And uh, loans were sanctioned through HUDCO. Um, and as per the reports of state nodal agencies, it says that 60,952 manual scavengers have been relieved from their work. And personally, I found this a bit confusing because they had only identified 58,000 workers. So how did 60,000 get relieved? So again, you see inconsistency in data. Um, and 911 towns were dis, uh, declared manual scavenging free in India. But also there was this evaluation report which spoke about, you know, what were some of the few constraints that the scheme faced. So one of them was um, there was a subsidy available to households to construct um, latrines, but there was no subsidy available to construct the superstructure. So you just had a toilet without a structure around it and these are very, you know, these are like policy flaws, like somebody overlooked it. Um, and another issue was the non-availability of spaces in uh, to construct twin pit latrines in um, congested urban areas. Um, uh, the state government refused or was rather reluctant to stand guarantee for a lot of loans. And the subsidy that was available for EWS families was only 45%, which was uh, an insufficient amount. Like um, a lot of people reported that this was not enough for them to actually take up the scheme. So I'll pass it on to Yukti. So uh, in, with respect to your question on data, so data is uh, not available at Husur. Uh, du uh, during our uh, visit, we whatever we collated was through interview process with the uh, officials at the ULB level. So data is a challenge. Like for example, when you talk about health and social security of sanitation workers, you want to know how many time, how many hours they are working, whether there is overtime, whether they are paid for that overtime, um, or uh, where, uh, wh how many leaves do they get. All those kind of questions come to mind, but data is not available for those things. And asking, like in the morning, sir also mentioned that getting the data from private sector is even more uh, difficult because it's not there. Be then it comes to problems of informal sector and how employ the scientists workers are employed in informal sector, and there is no regulation, monitoring, evaluation at the ULB level by the state, which it which should be there. So. It is a challenge that we are. So when I when I talked about results-based framework, this was the point that I was making that the idea is to create results and uh, and link them with indicators. And th those indicators should be actually decided by the ULB at the ULB level with uh, with the discussions at the community level and the work and with the workers. S for it to work and so that was it's a utopian <laughs> idea but just in addition to the it was part of that study uh, that's why this uh, we undertook that study to understand the sanitation management at the ULB that was the main objective of that study uh, wherein uh, the welfare of the sanitation workers was not the primary focus at that point of time and uh, the main challenge that we saw was like whether the ULB has been able to manage this. We were largely looking into the finances of the ULB, the f powers that they had to uh, manage this one, what was the role of the parastatal, whether there are any benefits that are given to whatever the sanitation work, are they being able to recover this through their water and other user charges was the thing that was uh, looked into. Uh, one thing we found was that uh, the overarching presence of the state 
with respect to creation of the capital assets, uh, uh, with respect to so uh, be it water management or the uh, solid waste management or liquid waste management, uh, makes it very difficult for the ULBs and they have been forced, I mean like uh, there are uh, instances of creation of escrow account and there are, uh, uh, I mean certain policies have been like trust on them to implement them and implement it in a certain manner. Uh, if uh, maybe given a chance, ULB would explore and come up with their own kind of thing. We have seen water users association at village level have been working very effectively, uh, especially uh, recovering the one dam costs. So this is something that what we found was like uh, there was like uh, consistent under recovery of both water and the sanitation charges wherein they are largely dependent on this uh, state transfers and this escrow account for this uh, uh, improvement of this sanitation uh, investments uh, also reduce their whatever their little that they could spend on their own. This resulted in whatever, even if the uh, local council had a willingness to enhance the welfare of the sanitation workers, their finances did not permit them. Yeah, just one last comment. So regarding, is this data uh, shared with Saf uh, like the Safai Karamchari Andolan and other such organizations, they do have access to the data. In fact, uh, from my reading, uh, at times they have also contributed to adding to the data with their own surveys. Um, uh, with regard to, uh, I think Avni had mentioned this point that, you know, when they are constructing toilets, why are they not uh, responsible for maintaining them? So I think this was one comment that we received from an ex-employee uh, informally during the study that the ULBs do not uh, take on more permanent staff because, it, you know, by outsourcing it, it reduces the burden on their finances, which again comes to, you know, they, do they have the financial capacity? So thank you. Uh, so first, I would like to congratulate all the uh, speakers for their excellent presentations. But this question is some more uh, for uh, the panel. Uh, I just want to uh, like bring this up that in the common understanding of public health, how uh, people understand it is, um, it is the access so towards the basic primary health care. And we talk about uh, nutrition, we talk about anemia, uh, anganwari centers. Uh, but uh, in this entire discourse, uh, how would you put the entire discussion on uh, mental health and the access to mental health, especially in rural areas? See, firstly, we'll have to define what we mean by public health. There are many definitions. It all started with water and sanitation. And if you talk about the history of modern public health within courts, it is supposed to have started with John Snow committing an act of vandalism by removing the handle of a water pump in Broad Street uh, and uh, trying to stall the cholera epidemic as a result, or cholera outbreak as a result. But we know public health means a lot more now. The way I define public health is to identify and influence the determinants, the varied determinants of health that operate at the population level, which impact upon individual health. So we are talking about policies, we are talking about systems, we are talking about programs, we are talking about community engagement, all of that coming under public health. So, mental health is an important element of service and definitely it is an important from point of view of health promotion to protect mental health and where mental health disturbances do occur to try and provide services not only in primary care but elsewhere too if required but mostly many of it them can be handled in primary care. Right now we are very short of trained human resources. But I think the health system cannot shrug off its responsibility. To its credit, India actually brought mental health very prominently into the discussion when 2011, the UN high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases took place. At that time only cardiovascular disease, cancers, chronic respiratory disease and diabetes were included on the ground that they are linked by four common factors that is unhealthy diets, inadequate physical activity, tobacco and alcohol. India 
Mr. Keshu Desharaju was there at that time, the additional secretary, I think, or secretary, I'm not sure, 2011. He ensured that mental health was actually raised prominently, and while it was not prioritized in those four, it was ultimately included in the political declaration. And continuing that advocacy, it has featured in the 2015 uh, SDGs. Mental health is a part of the SDG. Only question is, quantifying it as a target becomes a little difficult, but provision of services is absolutely mandatory, both in terms of protecting mental health at various levels, at the community level, whether it is children or adults or whoever it is, and also providing services, particularly if you can do it through trained mental health counselors or get your primary health care staff themselves to provide those services, good, but their skill enhancement is necessary. But I think mental health is a very important element, there's no doubt about it. It's part of public health, very much a part of public health. Uh, thank you, sir. So let's just, we can commence with closing comments if any of you would like to sort of sum up or engage with any of the themes that came up in the health session, then we can break for uh, Something very brief. For example, the municipality, I was wondering where the citizens are. Whose problem is it? So I want to go back to the point you made earlier in your presentation when you talked about the need for mixed methods and data at the local level. Now the point is that is needed, but who is to do it? Some of us can undertake a little bit of it. Even an agency like CBPS can do some of it. But the problem and the need is so big that, you know, 100 CBPSs will not be able to do it. We have to find another way to do it. And I've always wondered why we don't mobilize the college teachers. There are colleges everywhere in the districts. Some districts have several. Leave the engineering medical colleges out. There are a very different kettle of fish. But there are arts colleges, commerce colleges. And there are lots of teachers who want to do stuff in the, long before they get jaded. And I think you can do that. I will only share one experience I had when I was in ISEC. The ICSR gave us a mandate for a two-week training program for economics lecturers and colleges. And the Tamil Nadu government responded and sent 25 college teachers from all the districts, not from Chennai and Coimbatore, but various places. And the director at that time, very enlightened person called Satish Chandran, told me that, look, don't start to have a dinner with them the previous evening. Talk to them and then decide what you want to do. So it, it's very interesting how it, when they came into the institute, they all got single rooms in the guest house. They were very surprised. They thought they'd put it up together. Small thing. And to be honest, it didn't even strike me. There were rooms and we just allotted them. Then we had a dinner. We talked to them about what they want. After all, it was a contractor and we could tell him what we wanted. The, it was Money was coming from ICSR. That gave us a breakthrough. And then when we talked about it, it there is a curriculum that comes down to them from somewhere. And uh, the only resource they have are the local guidebooks. Very few of them had seen any textbooks from their own college days. So uh, how do we do it? You look at last year's question papers, look at somebody's guidebook. And, and they were not happy about that situation. They wanted to do more. Then I found very interestingly that they didn't know anything about the various documents that the government, they had never heard of the economic survey. They didn't know that the industry ministry brings out wholesale price index. So all I did, I, it was lucky. Uh, my friend Rakesh Mohan was economic advisor. I asked him, he sent me 30 copies of the uh, manual for calculating the wholesale price index. They knew what a price index was from their own statistics classes, but they never used it. So we sat down, I involved a lot of our PhD students in this process, and we taught them how to calculate a price index. We told them how to use it to estimate inflation. Interestingly enough, through the DNS allowance formula, they knew inflation. But how it was, how much it was, there was never any. They got it. We got them the economic survey and read it, and the topics they were supposed to teach were there, but they had never seen this. So we worked with them. The, the whole course was not, it was basically how to use some of these government documents. The Tamil Nadu government gave the state economic survey. So we used it. And I told them that we've got these things, take them home. So now the interesting point is not that. It's several years later I met them. And they had actually started doing this. They had got their students 
BCom students, art students, to go around and they had extended upon the ideas we said. You know, some of them said that, you know, um, the shops are selling at this price, but we calculated something and they started a dialogue. Somebody started looking at uh, bus fares, various little things like that. And I was astonished at the amount of energy. Now, the work they did, the methodology you used, will not lead to a major publication. It will not. But the point is they started work and the teachers got interested and over a period of three, four years it will improve. And for people like us, it's a starting point. It will give us a bit of an estimate of what to look for. And, we, and I think if you can mobilize college teachers, you'll cover the whole country very fast. They'd like to do this. The second point I want to make is, again, you pointed out there's a shortage of health workers, Anganwadi workers, teachers. This is true. We keep hearing about the large bureaucracy, but we don't have them where it matters. We don't have enough school teachers. We don't have enough policemen. We don't have enough forest guards. And these are the lower level jobs, and for whatever reason, we don't have them. But if employment were an objective of the government instead of a rate of growth, and you started doing this, the way you started with Asha's column, more volunteers would start working. In due course of time, it will become something. But the results will be visible. I mean, if you make some of the forest dwellers, the forest guards, they know forest better than I ever will. And if they're given a certain responsibility, why can't a lot of the plus two educated girls in the district be trained to be some kind of health worker or school teacher? Madhya Pradesh once did this experiment using plus two graduates of the village as school teachers, and it worked beautifully. So I think these are ways in which we not only get the data we want, but we mobilize a lot of people into interacting with their communities. And that itself will have a dynamic. Where it will go, I don't know. But I think we should start it, because we cannot do this however much research we do. No, all through the discussions, I was actually looking at the common theme of uh, independent institutions and how they inform policy. I mean, that's uh, the common theme of the two-way, two-day um, consultation. Now, health that way is, a, is, a, is an area which has several important characteristics. One is under our constitutional dispensation, it is a state subject. So every time you can't just be looking at Delhi and saying that you are not doing enough. What are the states doing? How much they are spending on health? Why this huge disparity between Kerala and Bihar? So these are issues, I think, which need to come up in some sort of a discussion. Second is, we discussed about the, per, the amount of money that is spent on health, 1% or 1.2% of GDP. Because health is a labor-intensive area, it is something which I think government should realize. You cannot economize on reducing outlay on health. In fact, there is a case to put more money on health by increasing the health uh, care infrastructure. Because we are talking about ha ASHAs, having one more ASHA at the district level, at the field level. And also, where is the male health worker? Do we have anybody for the males who constitute 50 percent of the population of this country? And unfortunately, in the rural areas and in poor households, they are the decision makers, unfortunately. So when the, you, are, you are empowering the woman, you are educating her, you are asking her, preparing her to uh, look for something, but where is this matching support coming from the householder, from the man, man head of the family? So we are not doing anything there. So today, when from reproductive health, when we're moving to total health, and we are making wellness center as the new concept, I think it is important to balance both, and then have a quarter of male health workers also at the field level. That's how you are going to spend more money, you have not just one more ASHA, and you have to increase this number tremendously and spend on that. And government cannot back off from spending money on health. It is not a private sector activity. The thinking is it's private sector which is do all that. Private sector is not going to do it. We have seen it in COVID. I mean, it has become so exploitative that I think ultimately everything came on the public sector. It's the government doctors, government hospitals who ultimately bear the brunt of the epidemic. So I think let us not forget that health is essentially a state subject, a state activity, and the states have to spend more money. And their budgetary, if you look at their budgets and the way they allocate money, it varies from 4% in Bihar to 11% in Kerala. It cannot be so, so disparate. You need to bring in certain standards in that. 
this is where I think government, at the government of India, they will have to use their incentives and also maybe some checks and balances to see that the state spend more money on health. This is the only way you can bring in. And there, to influence that sort of policy, I think organizations like CBPS and other independent institutions have played a great role. I think some of the research studies that we have seen today, I think are really great. I think these are the ways you can influence policy at various levels, not just at uh, state level or government of India level, even at the local level. If the Hosur Municipal Corporation can be influenced to do better for the sanitation workers, your job is done. That is ultimately what we need to look at. So that is all I have got to say. Thank you. From my side, I have picked up two important messages from either side. Uh, first is, just as we say in teaching, that everyone teaches and everyone learns, almost everyone can do research. So it's important for us to not only do, get participatory research, but to expand the number of people who can contribute to knowledge creation and certainly to knowledge translation wherever possible. And here the question of actually creating more employment in people-facing occupations where actually people are uh, really requiring services in the front lines. And we recognize that health actually provides an opportunity that way because just as we are going to see shrinkage of jobs in industry, agriculture and service sectors because of technology intensive substitution of human beings with a lot of technology. Health is going to remain one area, especially public health, where you will require a lot of human resources and that provides a continuing opportunity for employment and that is one message that we must push across very strongly and uh, finally I think we have arrived at that point of the day when food for thought is overtaken by thought for food. <laughs> Just one point, I, I think it's a, 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 a very valid issue about public health. I mean, because both of us are in the dais, I will take a couple of minutes. In 2004, when I was health secretary, just six months before the retirement, we thought public health, it's high time we bring it to the fore. Let us make public health the king. That is the time when we hatched upon this idea of having an independent organization for public health. That's how the Public Health Foundation of India came up. And um, I left within six months, I had to go. Then Dr. Reddy steered it. And today, PHFI is one of the leading institutions which influence public policy in government. And it has five public health schools. Apart from that, the people who, who are at the helm of affairs play a very important role in policy formulation in government of India. And I think we are really uh, happy to see Dr. Reddy coming over and then talking in this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, I just like to summarize the conversation just a little bit. So one more, 30 seconds. I promise I will, uh, I will make this very quick. I think I would like to thank all the presenters, the speakers, the young scholars who came, as well as the prominent people on the dais, as well as audience members, because you have engaged for you know, a good amount of time, as well as you know, asked interesting questions. And I think the focus that I would, I would take from here, the kinds of lessons I would take from here, is to have the importance, and, and Professor Srinath, you said this, so beautifully uh, to have uh, clarity in the complexity of what we are facing. Now, whether that is healthcare, that's poverty line, whether that's uh, sort of engaging with sanitation workers, and, and the kinds of conversation we can have around the complexity of knowledge, um, methods, uh, forms of you know health, the types of health, as well as the historical sort of, thank you, Professor Vyasalu, for bringing that there is an historical conversation that also needs to be taken you know, into consideration when we are engaging with current policies and current themes. Uh, and so I feel like um, the thing that I started off with, that you know, we should have marry uh, sort of the youth with certain forms of uh, experience, I think you said it, enthusiasm plus strict verification. I think that's a good mandate for all of us in this room to, to kind of take forward, regardless of our sort of uh, mental, physical age. Uh, and I think I'd also like to end with a sort of a uh, call to ourselves in some ways about, um, you said about how uh, Tony Morrison's quote about, you know, if we have to create, if we don't create change, we extend the present. I think that's a beautiful way of uh, putting it. And so, therefore, we have a responsibility f to ourselves. I mean, wherever we are, in whatever position, uh, we have to sort of be question uh, things, to be to make things accountable, and then, as you said, to advocate for social change. So, thank you, everyone, and thank you for being such an interesting and interested crowd. Thank you.